I um I have a fly rod addiction, um, <laughs> I, like most guys do. But I have this I have this formula, um, and some people have heard this formula before. But the number of fly rods that you need is a simple equation: n, which is the number you have, plus one. Three, two. David, I grew up in uh, Memphis, you know, in the city. And so um, I was fortunate enough to have a grandfather and a dad that loved to fish. And so uh, Mississippi River runs, you know, right through the heart of the city and it's just full of oxbows. And uh, so we spent, you know, summer weekends fishing for crappie and brim and bass and, you know, all the warm water species in those oxbows, um, you know, kind of in the Mississippi Delta, whether that be in um, Eastern Arkansas or North Mississippi or, or what have you. But that was, um, that was where we started. You know, I fell in love with fishing, um, you know, I- I- until later on we started to trout fish. Did you get out on the river? Not much. It was, it's pretty intimidating, especially carrying around a, a little kid, you know? So we fished, um, a lot of those Delta lakes that are formed, you know, off of it, a horseshoe, Grenada, Sardis, Tunica cutoff. Um, that was long before they built all the casinos in Tunica. So, yeah, right. uh, yeah, you know, it was just, just mostly ditch fishing is really what it was. Lily pads and warm water, you know, I mean, me and my buddies would ride our bikes around and fish, you know, ponds behind Walmarts and apartment complexes and everything else. But, you know, you get your tugs where you can, right? I would still like to do that today. A lot of times just to be able to go out and do that, you know, fishing in a fishing in a pond. I like to say fishing in a pond that I shouldn't be fishing in. You sure, know, like a golf yeah, course absolutely. or something like that. I don't do that anymore, but as a kid, I, I did that quite a bit. Is get to a golf course because you know there's some really good stuff in there that never even gets a look. Um, oh, absolutely. Of anything else, but did you ever fish Midway, Arkansas, which is pretty good ways over there? I don't think that we did. If we did, I don't remember it, but I've heard of it certainly. Midway is full of crappie, bluegill, bass, and snakes. Okay, yeah, and lots, sure. Lots of catfish, of course, but a whole lot of snakes, like a ton of snakes. Oh, uh, that's where I, that's probably where my snake fear came from. A friend of mine asked me the other day, you know, why are you so scared of snakes? I said, I'm not really scared of them. If I can see them, I'm okay with them. But I mean, I've walking down to the boat, boat at Midway one time and didn't see one until the last second. And, you know, he was, he was all fired up. I just was able to get away from him, but not cool, not fun, nothing about it fun. Sure. How about, Absolutely. uh, did you ever get to fish real foot or anything like that? I, you know, we went to Real Foot, I think, for a field trip, looking at eagles, kind of back oh, when yeah. eagles were, were not a thing, you know. I mean, yeah. Um, but mostly, you know, Sardis, Grenada, uh, Horseshoe, those were kind of our bread and butter. You could get there within about an hour of Memphis, you know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. what, uh, you know, wasn't an all-day commitment. But, uh, you know, a lot of cypress trees, a lot of cane pole fishing, drowning minnows uh, for crappie under the cypress trees snakes dripping in the trees hanging yep. everywhere you know yep. <laughs> i can remember on more than one occasion uh, my grandfather who i called papa had a, a ranger bass boat you know and remember those snakes falling out of the trees into the bottom of the boat and his i mean just as fast as they would hit he'd take that skull and paddle yep. and just flip <laughs> them right back out you yeah. know yep because he sculled he didn't run a trolling motor you know he sculled yeah it was kind of his his jam was sculling man there's a real art to that and, and absolutely that's, that's if you don't know that's taking a boat panel paddle in one hand basically sitting on the on the back of the front of the boat and then just working that paddle without ever bringing it out of the water you just kind of work it back and forth and turn it with your wrist to make that boat go whichever way you want to go i guess that's probably a decent description of how to scull I would absolutely guess, yeah. yeah absolutely kind of figure eight in that thing in the water just different directions pulling that nose one way or the other yeah. you know yeah that's a true art that's that, true. that is hard that's that's an art that it takes some time to really get good at it but somebody that's really good at it is is a master at getting you in the place that you need to be for sure yeah that's right that's right well, welcome into Southeastern Fly, uh, the Southeastern Fly podcast. Thanks for stopping by and giving us a listen. Feel free to share this with uh, your friends and fishing partners. Hit that subscribe button. That helps us out. Don't forget, we've got the contest for the uh, bag of swag. The contest continues. 
for the wittiest five-star review. The wittiest five-star review is picked by a panel of judges, and they are anglers, so they're a little bit unsavory. They're going to pick the uh, the best five-star review. Once they tell me who that is, uh, who that winner is, I'm going to get in touch with them and give them the bag of swag. Time's running out on the on the contest. Remember, the contest started on August 1st for all you folks that are listening. This would probably be your last chance at, at uh, me reminding you to, to uh, enter the contest because it finishes on December 25th in our, our Season 3 episode one starts in January of 2021 and 21 2021 can't come fast enough if you haven't entered the contest now would be a great time to do that so let's get rolling this guy here was referred to me by a friend Susan Thrasher who who wrote Thrasher's Guide to Fly Fishing Susan said you know what you ought to you ought to interview this guy he's the owner of Rising River Guides in Cotter Arkansas he began guiding in 2006 on the Little Red River near Heber plus the Iliamna drainage near Bristol Bay he also guided on the Roaring Fork in Colorado and then the Yampa in Steamboat one of my favorite rivers currently he guides on the White River system below Bull Shoals this guy likes to throw everything that we like to throw on Southeastern Fly and we've already made a connection he's a good guy he's going to be entertaining so please welcome matt milner matt thanks for stopping by for a visit yeah thanks for having me on the show david i'm super excited to talk to you guys we just kind of came off of how you started fishing sound like that very much so like i did uh, some around Memphis and that sort of thing in a very young age it, it sounds like you started with a kind of a simple rod and reel and then a cane pole those types of things uh drowning worms possibly drowning crickets that sort of thing so Absolutely. how do you how do you go from that? How does Matt go from that to a fly rod? How do you get there? My dad had a group of guys that he worked with that uh, were father and sons, and they all would had an annual fishing trip on the lower White River around Mountain View, right at Sillamore Creek. And uh, these guys called their expedition Team Trout every year. It was just you know, good fellowship, guys fishing with their kids, making memories, uh, eating catfish at night, you know, catching fish. And it was really fun, but it was very rudimentary style fishing. They turned the White River style longboat sideways. You cast back out upstream with, you know, 11 pieces of corn jammed on a hook with a spinner <laughs> or something and then bounce it on the bottom. And, you know, every so often, you know, you, the guy throws out a handful of corn and we did that for a couple of years, and my dad uh, uh, had an opportunity to take a class through the Mid South Fly Fishers with John and Dan Barry about you know fly fishing 101. And so he took the course, and just instantly it, he got the bug. And so he then, he then took a rod building course, and from that point forward, we were fly fishermen. And the 101 course worked, and and here I am today, you know, making a living with the fly rod in my hand. So I was about the third grade, I guess, when dad, when we switched over from spin fishing to fly fishing. So you remember how long that first rod was for a third grader? How old would you have been? Eight or nine? Maybe? Uh, you know, Somewhere? my dad, my dad actually built me a, a really great rod. Um, and it was a nine foot four weight sage light line. And that was the rod that I, I caught every fish I caught on, you know, for many, many years. Um, uh, nine foot. I mean, you know, he, he, we had a couple Cabela's rods, a couple L.L. Bean rods, you know, but everything was nine foot. I mean, there was not any, uh, Hey, you're short. We're going to get you a short ride. Right. It's, hey, this is what you fly fish with, you know? So, and if, if you never knew any difference, okay. That's nine right. foot, this is that's what it's right. supposed to be. This is what it's supposed to be. So how long, how long did you keep that rod and fish with it? And I don't know if you still have it or not, but how long did you keep it and fish with it? I absolutely still have it. Good for you. Um, yeah, you bet. I absolutely still have it. I um I have a fly rod addiction, um <laughs> like like most guys do. But I have this, I have this formula. Um, and some people have heard this formula before. But the number of fly rods that you need, um, is a simple equation. N, which is the number you have, plus one. <laughs> Okay, took me a second. <laughs> took me a second, yeah. but I totally get it. Yeah, so, number so you have I, plus I, one. I have plenty of rods. I don't really. I don't. I get rid of a lot, but I buy a lot too. So. Um, that, that there's a few rods that I've kept and that sage LL is one of them. Okay. Tell me, tell me some of the places I know it took you to the white river, but I was talking to, to, uh, uh, Frank Smithhurst the other day, Frank and I got into this discussion of where a fly rod may take you. Meaning if I didn't have this fly fishing addiction, I probably would have never went to the Ampa. I may or may not have gone to Steamboat. Sure. So where all has that rod taken you? Um, you know, we fished the Little Red. We fished the North Fork. Um, we fished the Spring River. You know, all those pretty close ones to Memphis. Um, 
you may have heard the running joke uh, being from, you know, Memphis area is what's the best thing about Memphis and it's Arkansas is the <laughs> answer, <laughs> which I, I don't find to be true. I love Memphis, but you know, we fished the stuff that was close, but one of the most, one of the more memorable trips um, I took that rod on with my dad was we went and stayed um, at Abe's on the San Juan and, and fished the San Juan. And um, that, you know, rod caught every fish I caught on that trip there. And, Truthfully, I, I fell in love with the Southwest and eventually moved to Durango, probably because of that trip. You know, I mean, yeah. dad and I went out there and I just thought, I want to live here. I want to fish here. And and the closest way to do that without living in the middle of nowhere is Durango, right, <laughs> you know, right. 45 minutes away versus living in Navajo Dam. So yeah. um, <laughs> that, that would probably be the most, you know, important place that it took me um, just because it started the kind of path of... Um, being a true trout bum. So that rod took you many, many different places to start out with, and the San Juan is a big one. What could you pass along to somebody out there that's that listening to this podcast, flying on a plane, driving in a car, mowing a yard, shoveling snow, that sort of thing? What do you think that you learned uh, from from that fly rod and your dad? What, what can you pass along to a listener to kind of help them understand what it means to you? I learned that you can do a lot with a nine-foot four weight. And today, when I go out fishing and, and guiding, I bring, you know, six, eight rods in the boat sometimes. And each rod is very task-specific. But the reality is you can do a lot with one fly rod. You know, I mean, I midge-fished with that rod on the San Juan. And I, I remember, you know, standing at Rim Shoals one day and um, throwing a woolly booger that was way, way, way too big. <laughs> for that four way, you know, and just uh-huh. flexing the fire out of that rod. And, and I remember swinging it and catching a really nice brown trout on it, um, standing out there on the islands. And I did everything with one rod. I caught largemouth bass on it, you know, around the city of Memphis. I caught, you know, stock trout, wild trout. I mean, it's easy to become gear obsessed, I guess. But um, really, if you find a rod you like and you love, It'll do everything you want it to do, which is some adjustments to the way you rig, adjustments to the way you cast, and you don't have to have 100 rods to go out and have a good time. I agree totally with that. I still want to go back to you how many how many rods you have plus one. That's more of, <laughs> that's more of us. That's more right. so of that's more that's of a right. want than a need. It's not a need; it's a want. And there's nothing that's wrong right. with that. You know, if you that's want right. something, you want it. So I like to I like to say that whenever I sneak off, and I don't take the boat. I take you know I made run off down to the to the elk down there is usually where i end up if i'm trying to get away and i'll take one rod uh, i'll take some flies in my pocket take some hemostats i may or may not take a net i don't know i might not even take one uh some tippet maybe maybe some leader that's about it you know maybe some indicators some dry flies something like that and just go down there and fish for a few hours and it's almost like minimal but i mean i may sure. I, like you said i may throw a woolly bugger i may throw a dry fly I may throw a heavy nymph. I may throw two nymphs under indicators. I may I may tight line it with with just you know, and that could be it, honestly, it's not a specific rod. It's whichever one happens to be there, hanging in the garage, and it's rigged up. That's the one I go for. So you're right. I think I think we get into that. I need four or five rods. I and I'm air quotes here. I need four or five rods. Right. Is more of I just want another rod. Uh, That's but, right. But man, I can sure justify needing another rod for sure so it's good that you had one that kind of took you and got you got you started and i'm just sitting here thinking of a guy standing out in the middle of the white river throwing a woolly bugger on a four-way and the woolly bugger's just way too big and you know you're you're fully extended forward and that woolly bugger's still buzzing by your ear before it ever starts its loop to go out there and drop into the water <laughs> absolutely <laughs> absolutely <laughs> oh so once you started that guiding career you ended up back at the Little Red somehow, didn't you? I did. Um, my my dad eventually built a cabin on the Little Red River, and that became, you know, our home waters. We spent as much time as we could there. And um, I'd moved out to Durango. I, I I fell in love with fishing and stuff, but I was young. I was still kind of a, a wild animal, you know, and so <laughs> I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And uh, I ended up back in Memphis. I was working in a restaurant, um, you know, working as a line cook and running saute and, um, which I'm passionate about food. I love to cook, but I don't like cooking in a, in a kitchen, uh, you know, in the city of Memphis late night. And so I had asked my dad, I said, dad, would you mind if I went over to the river 
pressure wash your deck, clean out your gutters, you know, try to figure out what I need to do next in life. And um, that's where I ended up meeting the guy that gave me my first guiding job, Jamie Rouse, um, down there on the Little Red River. And so I just stayed. I never left, you know, but it was I really just went over there as kind of a um, a reset. You know, I was just going to fish for a month and kind of clear my head and think about what I wanted to do. And the universe just, you know, put it right in my lap and said, hey, this is what you're going to do, man. You're going to be a fly fishing guide. So, oh, so cool. Yeah. How long did you guide down there? I got it down there for about 10 years. Um, I, I spent a couple seasons guiding in Alaska um, during the summers, but I just came back and did falls and winters there and whatnot. So yeah, I was down there for about 10 years. So now we're building those stepping stones of building now a career. What do you think was passed along to you that you could pass along to the angler? You know, I learned so much uh, down there on the Little Red River and, and – um, I just immersed myself in that river day in, day out. I never said no. I fished as much as I could. I never turned down business. I never turned down the opportunity to go play with a friend on the river after work or before work. Or, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, yep. just I never missed an opportunity. Um, I wanted to learn as much as I could. And, and um, you know, it's a special place uh, being able to emerge yourself into one fishery like that. You know, I, I spent some time on the white and the North Fork and whatnot too, but really I just let that river consume me and I tried to master that river, you know. I guess it's easy to get wanderlust and want to fish other places, you know, but man, there's, these tailwaters are so cool because they're different rivers every day, whether they're running 3,000 CFS or 5,000 CFS or 9,000 CFS or they haven't run any water for two weeks. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And then right. all of a sudden is now a gigantic spring Creek. Um, I, don't, I don't know what I would tell the, tell the angler that's listening other than just, you know, try to learn everything you can about your river, you know, just gobble it up, man. Learn everything you can about it because these things just, they're like onions. You just keep peeling back layers and right. finding fish in different places and you can find they can eat different stuff. And, uh, it's really easy to get complacent fishing, right? It's easy to say, hey, I know, you know, Mossy Shoals fish is good with a sow bug and a red midge or a young special below it. But there's still, you know, 45 other miles of trout water that have great fish biting on different stuff, you know. So um, I, I guess just don't be, af don't be afraid to fish different things. Try different holes. Try fishing your favorite hole with a different tactic or you know mix it up a little bit and it kind of feels like you're fishing new water yeah i think one of the things my grandfather told me one time and i was basically bragging about how great the fishing was when we lived in knoxville and i was fishing up on the clinch and uh I was, you know we caught i don't know 50 fish before lunch or something something crazy like that you know and and he said uh what what all did you try and i told him what we tried and it was just basically one thing and he said you know david when the fish are really biting that's whenever you need to be trying different stuff which is wisdom of course beyond beyond my Absolutely. years every guide i think has a hole or two or three on the, on the river that they're like i know that i'm going to get something here you know that's right? right i've got a 90 percent chance a whole lot better than average chance of getting something so you know if you can catch it two or three different ways you're less likely to get skunked on your trip out there but i think your your comment of just immersing yourself in that river it's excellent on, on several different fronts and another one of the reasons why i say that is because generally i'm speaking generally here if you can catch a fish on a specific type of water on your river you can generally find that same type of river water somewhere else you know be it a sure. run if i'm really good at fishing runs you're probably going to be able to find a run on just about every river that you're going to trout fish on it may be a little different mm -hmm. than what you're used to but those same ideas and those that same thought process can go with it and, and help you become a better angler part of what i saw probably before this year was almost like you had to go away from your home waters to get a good experience mm -hmm. and i don't think that's true i think that you can have that good experience and learn all you can and, and take it not to say that you don't take those trips because i want to take them too and do sure but don't miss what's right around the corner from you that's right you know i often um not often i always run my trips from a boat um i don't do any any wade fishing anymore on the white river system uh like i used to on the little red and so right you know a lot of times for me um on a day off the boat may not be attractive right i may not want to go get in that boat and so i learn leaps and bounds by just getting out and going on foot for a little while, even if it's two hours and going and taking, like you said, one fly box, one rod, just go, Hey, let's go try some different stuff standing, you know, stationary and, 
And that really can, you know, teach you a lot and, and alter the way you might run your guide program, you know, by just fishing a little bit differently than you normally do. It might show you a hole that you didn't know was there. That's happened with me. I've a absolutely floated down to a certain spot and got out of the boat and, and just kicking around fishing uh, just with some friends and, and discovered not too long ago that I'm oh, darn there's a hole I didn't even know was here. How long have you been fishing that stretch of river? Probably 15 years. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I just never, I'd never stepped off in it. Now, when you step sure. off in a hole, you can figure out it's there real quick. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, that's right. You you said it, Jamie kind of gave you your career. Is there anything he passed along to you? Jamie passed it along to me a lot. Um, I was the first guy that he'd ever hired. And interestingly enough, I, I'll tell you a quick story. I was fighting a, a nice fish. Had a little uh, 1648 War Eagle aluminum boat. You know, I'm floating down the river this thing and i'm fighting a nice brown no one's in the boat with me I'm by myself and jamie pulls up he's got customers with him and i don't i mean i don't know jamie you know i mean i know he's a guy but i, I don't know him and he says what are you fishing with you know and i'm stripping this <laughs> fish in and I, I said copper john you know like not optimal time to like have a conversation right and uh he says huh me too and uh of course it's midsummer there's some mayflies and stuff you know flying around but um he said well i don't know who you are kid but Every time I get ready to fish a run, you're right in the middle of it. So give me a call when you get off the river. And he gave me a business card. And I'm like, what does this dude want? And I went over to his house that night and, and had dinner with him and his wife, Katie. And he propositioned me with a, with a gig. And so it just, you know, it was a really cool thing. Uh, interesting way to, you know, like I said, fall into it. But he passed down a lot of wisdom to me. But also on a more sentimental front, uh, he passed down to me a pair of able pliers um, that he guided with. And he wore as part of his uniform every day and um so i wore those pliers every time i stepped foot on the water whether i was guiding or whether i was fishing with a friend or fishing with my dad or whatever i mean it was equally as important to me to have my pliers as it was to have my rod you know what i mean that yeah. was just it's the only tool i carry i don't wear nippers i don't carry hemostats i, I wear a pair of pliers and that's it so yeah those were it was a really special it was a really nice gift it was a generous gift um, especially as a young guy, a young man, they were very expensive, you know, I mean, yeah. granted he, he got his money out of them, but, um, you know, it was a really, it was a really nice gesture. And so I, I wore those every time I, I guided up until just recently when I, um, moved to Arkansas and, and hired my first guide, not at Yampa Valley, uh, Colorado, but cause I was a partner in that company. But once I started my own company and I hired my first guide, um, it was really cool to be able to kind of pass that torch on to him and and keep the legacy alive. Because Rouse is a legend. I mean, you know, the, the guy is, um, he's one of the fishiest dudes I know. And so I think that those pliers will probably have a long life ahead of them for, for probably more than just Jeremy, who has them now. So it's kind of cool. Oh, that's so cool. What a great story. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Especially at that, you said, as a young man, that is, it's a big deal to get a get a tool like that as a younger man absolutely it's it's my my favorite tool you know yeah so you stayed over there you said 10 years on the little red is that right that's right yeah yeah sure did i stayed over there um really like 2005 i was i was over there and um 2006 i guess is when i really i tried to start guiding on my own some and 2006 is when i started guiding for jamie you know for real i mean not just a trip here and a trip there right um and so i stayed there until 2015 before i moved out to steamboat and we talked a little bit about steamboat yeah. and the yampa and, and uh how great of a place that's a special place out there but you're right you better have some coin if you're gonna stay out there very long because it's a little bit expensive <laughs> that's right, <laughs> that's right. E everything i mean i mean yeah everything is expensive out there but it sure is a great place to be that's right but then you then you some how ended up back on the white that's right i was a minority partner in the uh, company out there and i loved it but it was it was a stretch for me it was expensive and the winters were kind of tough you know I, I got the wintertime blues and the seasonal blues oh, and, yeah. <laughs> um, and i'm a boat guy i've been guiding out of a boat the whole time i was on the little red and a lot of that stuff out there uh, gets a little too bony and so we fished the colorado and the roaring fork and some other rivers to float but you know it's it's an exhausting way to make a living in colorado with a 120 day float season I mean, do i have enough snow or not enough and um it's just stressful and you know I, the familiar waters of arkansas drew me back 365 day a year float season i can be in my boat every single day permits you know are really really easy here in arkansas our guys license are incredibly cheap colorado in like 2016 i think we spent like eight thousand dollars in permits and fees and 
you know, it's just, a, it's a different way of life. And don't get me wrong. I love Colorado. I've lived there twice, you know, but, but to me, Arkansas, we've got everything you need. You know, the, I love the small mouth, our native sons. I love our trout fishing. I love the people that live here. You know, I, I feel like I've never lived in a community as strong as the community we, we live in here in Cotter. We have a small organic vegetable farm. That's my wife's dream. That was her bargaining tool is to, yes, I'll leave one of the coolest towns in America, <laughs> Steamboat Springs, and moved to Cotter, Arkansas with you is I want to start a vegetable farm. So um, we've just had amazing support from our community and friends helping us with that. And I don't know, man, there's just something about you know, North Arkansas specifically just really feels like home to me. You know, I think, I think we're here for the duration. So it's a, it's a cool place. Something to be said for landing where you want to land. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you're, you're now in, in Cotter, you got a boat, you, you're getting a, your guiding business up and running, fishing around that area over there. I've been on the white a number of times, putting a number on it, wouldn't do it justice. The fishing around that part of Arkansas is super diverse. So you've got trout, smallmouth, largemouth bass in the lakes, a lake or so with stripers in it. You're guiding on the white, so let's talk about the white just a little bit. Absolutely. It's 700 miles long. It flows from Arkansas into Missouri, then back into Arkansas. You primarily are fishing starting at Cotter, so that's below Bull Shoals Dam, and Bull Shoals has eight generators. Those eight generators generate water, trout water, cold water for about 90 miles so a couple of places that i like there and it seems to be around the the confluences so the first confluence is about 33 miles down and that's where the buffalo comes in about 44 miles the norfolk joins in that's right below that is calico rock i've spent some time there believe it or not that that is a yeah. little hole in the wall right there but a really cool place it sure is and it's beautiful it is it we've stayed up on the bluff there many times sure and, and played uh poker in, in the evening and fish for trout during the day and really it's a cool place to be there so there's 90 miles of trout water all the way before the trout water runs out or before the cold water runs out i guess it's kind of what the, the anglers would say there's there's rain Rainbow cutthroat, brown trout, brookies. My uncle sent me a picture of a tiger trout that somebody caught over there a couple right. of weeks ago. Palomino trout, smallies. Is there anything else that, that you can think of that it doesn't necessarily have to be game fish? You know, I mean, there's certainly um, some suckers, red horse and um, northern hog snares. And you might catch a large mouth in the river occasionally or, or something. But for the, for the most part, you know, that water's so cold. All the warm water fish, they stay up in their creeks and they do their own thing in the tributaries and stuff. And occasionally after big rains or whatnot, they come out, feed a little bit in the river and then come back in. But, you know, mostly it's a trout fishery, which is pretty cool. I mean, there's not a lot of bycatch. I mean, it's pretty much trout. Yeah. I can't think of, as you were going through that, I can't think of anything else that I've ever caught over there other than a smallie there kind of below the confluence of the buffalo on the... That's right. On the buffalo side a of the light. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. I might catch a walleye occasionally, you know. Anything is possible when they run floodgates. Mm -hmm. And we had the floodgates open on Bull Shoals Lake many times this year. Just the lake got the highest it's ever gotten in recorded history. So, um, you know, you you saw quite a few common carp, saw some paddlefish, you know, some drum and things of that nature. Might be, you know, but they don't like it. Once they get in that cold water, they try to get out of it pretty <laughs> quick, you know. <laughs> True. They're warm water, that's for sure. That's they, right. Yeah, they like the right. hot tub a whole lot better than the cold water. That's right. What do you think you might like best about fishing the white or being on the white or guiding on the white? Man, that's a that's a loaded question because <laughs> there's so there's so many things I like best about it. Um, one of the things I, I really like about the White River is each season offers something different. When I fish the Little Red, you know, we predominantly just generally nymph fished, and that was it. You know what I mean? We threw some streamers. Don't get me wrong. We we I think Jamie and I really pioneered a lot of the streamer fishing stuff way back in the day before you could buy a lot of big streamers and things like that online and uh we were using old school jim teeny lines 200 grain lines and stuff but I, I think what i like about the white is that each season the fishing is truly different and you know we can feed fish uh dry flies um great caddis hatch great sulfur dun hatch great terrestrial fishing um you know we've caught hopper fishing but the reality is most of the time those fish are gulping our bugs as cicadas. Um, we have, you know, a annual summer cicada hatch as well as the periodic cicada hatches. We have good streamer fishing, good shad kill fishing, um, you know, just dead drifting floating shad, um, low water, great soft tackles, great midges. And 
you know, truly you can fish so many different techniques. And as each season comes, you shift and kind of settle into a technique for a while. That keeps it fresh. You know, it keeps you always excited and learning and teaching somebody something new. If I was to go back and make my living there today on the Little Red, I might be more diverse. But that's one of the things I really like about the white is just how diverse each season is and how much fun it is to kind of settle into each season, um, specifically cicadas and caddis. I mean, that's, that's what I love. I like shorts. I like chacos. I like, uh, you know, late afternoons um, when the river gets empty. I like watching a fish come up and eat a, a two inch um, cicada or, you know, a size 14 caddis. I mean, that's, that's what makes me happy. Some guys, all they want to do is that articulation nation, you know, and that's cool. I love it too, but it's, it's not the same to me as um, a six weight and a big old fat Albert or something, you know, that is so much fun. I mean, he, I've, I have fished all day for one fish. Um, oh yeah. On the, on what we call the hopper, you know, the treasure mm-hmm. patch, but knowing that when this one fish eats, wherever it eats within, you know, the next six miles of this river, I know it's going to be a good one. And I know I'm going to, I'm going to be able to watch mm-hmm. that and I'm going to be able to see it. You know, it's not like it's That's a streamer right. and it's, you know, six foot under and I'm not seeing all I feel is a tug. I mean, uh, there's a real good chance I'm going to see that come, that thing rise up and eat. That's right. That's right. So let's talk about some of those flies. You, you kind of told us fat Albert's during terrestrial season and then cat your caddis hatch is good but what about nymphs because there are a lot of folks that like to, to drown nymphs what what do you think sure, is, what's sure. a good nymph a, a general nymph of if somebody's going over there to fish maybe they're not gonna be in a boat maybe they're gonna be waiting maybe they are maybe they're taking their own boat what would you what would you say what would be something good to start out with sure you know no matter what they're doing with the water whether they've got minimum flow on which is you know 760 cfs or somewhere thereabouts or all eight generators and no matter what time of year it is there's always sow bugs and there's always scuds. Um, So you can't go wrong, you know, using a sow bug or a scud as a point fly or your lead fly. Um, You know, they're great because you can load them down with lead and tungsten and (laughs) sink them hard and, you know, maybe (laughs) whittle away some of your split shot if you needed to. Um, You don't have to be proficient at knowing, hey, what is that little bug? You know, is that a little bitty caddis or a blue wing all? You know, you don't have to know any of that stuff. Just sow bug and a scud is always a good bet. Any colors there? For sow bugs, I stick to tan, uh, tan or kind of a tannish gray occasionally, you know, but traditionally tan is kind of my go-to. I fish a, a super simple bug that, you know, is just sow scud dubbing tan with a thin skin shell back on it you know and a tungsten bead and a lot of lead and it works well my scud i like a humpback scud or any standard scud and i like those in gray i like them in olive and i like them in orange um we get on a a lot of periods like especially um you know water may drop out a little bit they cut the generation back and then when they you know rise it back up if any of those scuds and stuff were on the edges they die or start right. to molt or whatnot. And so, you know, they start to turn orange and, and I really do really well sometimes with those orange scuds. So orange on rising water makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Especially over on the North Fork. It's, it's more scud centric and the white is more sow bug centric, but I mean, they both exist on both tail waters. Um, so you can't go wrong there. You also can't go wrong with just a good old fashioned um, soft tackle. I fish little wire body soft tackles a lot, you know, with whatever color wire you like, whether it's, you know, red or orange or yellow or red and yellow or, you know, what have you. But it's always a good choice, a sow bug and a soft tackle, and you should be able to at least catch a couple fish, you know, no matter what time of year it is. Are you swinging those? A lot of times I dead drift it, and then I get to the end, and, yeah, let it give it a swing, let that sow bug or let that soft tackle rise and um, and start back over, you know. That way you can kind of – get a little bit of both out of each drift. Since that sow bug doesn't swim, you know, I want it to tick the bottom at least a little bit. I'm finding that that maybe a a soft tackle helps catch fish whenever somebody's not a real good mender and they have they're especially somebody like is a is a dry fly fisherman that that can't put Mm -hmm. out enough line to make a fly dead drift. Oh sometimes I'll just put a a a soft tackle on the underneath a nymph and just say, Here, here you go, throw this out there. I can't get you to quit 
tight lining so much. So we'll get something on something that looks like it's trying to swing. That's (laughs) absolutely, absolutely. So it's kind of (laughs) cheating, but so no shame in that. No, no. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what about streamers? So we have a, you mentioned shad kill. We have a shad kill here. The, the widest is known for folks fishing those great big flies, those great big streamers you know, six, seven, eight inches, whatever. That's that's what's all over the internet. And and we fish bigger stuff here too, so I get it. But you were talking about some of the streamers that you fish. During the shad kill, we just try to match the shad. That's really all we try to do here. So I'm assuming sure. it's probably pretty close to what you're doing over there. Oh, yeah. Shad kill time, you know, a lot more dead drifting stuff. I'm throwing a lot of, you know, little uh, zonkers and bunny strips and floating shad like Todd Boyer's wiggle minnow. Uh, that's always a good one. You know, you can even use like a pencil popper, you know, just to just to float um, something. I mean, it's it's white and it's floating, you know. I mean, you can overthink it. I yes, mean, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I saw, you know, a, so. I saw a trout eat a cigarette butt one day on a, on yeah, a shad kill. Sure. Some dude flipped a cigarette butt in and it just got smashed. So yeah, you can. That's a good. That's a good way to put it. You can overthink the shad kill. That's right. That's right. You know, when they're gorging. Especially our perfect storm here for shad kill is the fact that um, they closed down Bull Shoals Dam November first, the first three quarters of the mile, three quarters a uh, mile of river. They closed that down to let those brown trout spawn in peace. February first, they open it back up. That coincides with it being, you know, one of the colder months of the year, and those shad have a greater opportunity to start coming through. They could have been coming through for two months in December and January. We just don't know it uh, because we're not up there. You know what I mean? But they come off a spawn. They haven't seen a fly for three months. And, um, you know, they're trying to pack on a few more pounds. And all of a sudden, there's floating white shad everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you you just put something white on. I mean, marabou on it. We call it an Arkansas beadhead. And it's just literally like a 5262 straight chain cook, white tungsten bead. White marabou on top, gray on bottom. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Arkansas beadhead. You know, it's super simple. Um, that was a fly a guy named Dale Fulton had created down here who started Blue Rune Flies out in Montana and then eventually uh, came down to Arkansas. So he was a legend, you know. That's interesting that, that you're, you're talking about the, those people. that There's a lot of people that land back in Arkansas that go out and do different things, and they land back there. I had heard somewhere, I don't remember where I heard it from, and I'm sure you probably had had were in on this when Jamie was talking about. He was fishing a floating shad and dropping, like, something off of it, like a woolly bug or something, you know, some mm-hmm. some type of, type of fly. So it's basically, it's... It's almost like a dry dropper with with uh, with big streamers on a shad kill, and absolutely, that is a gem of an idea right there that absolutely works. Especially with that wiggle minnow, um, it's really pretty cool because you know those shad float and the generators are down low, so the shad come through stunned and they float to the surface. So that wiggle minnow is pretty cool when you throw it on a sinking line. You strip, you strip that forty five degree head, it dives, and then when you pause it especially if you have a little white marabou jig or something below it, all of a sudden that thing starts lifting through the water column and you get a lot more eats on that pause than you think, you know, it's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. And it, it, if it's a big enough wiggle minnow, it'd bring them both up at a, at a fairly good mm-hmm. rate that, you know, if you can, right. if you can match that rate, you're doing pretty good, you know, that's right. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what about the big, what about the great big streamers? I don't want to, I'm not here to get every information, every piece of information I can, but I hear so much about people throwing eight, nine, 10 inch streamers over there and catching sure. huge, huge, huge browns. And it sounds like if you, if you buy into the press, it sounds like I'm going to catch four or five huge browns a day if I can just throw eight inch streamer. That's kind of what, it's not saying that, but it's alluding to that. Sure. We have a lot of pressure on these rivers anymore. You know, there was a time 15 years ago, 14 years ago, whatever, 12 years ago, that we used to put 20 fish in the boat over 20 inches in a day throwing streamers all the time. Sunshine, cloud, you know, it didn't matter. But there was very few people doing it. Now we've got, you know, this mass exodus of Michigan guides that come down in the winter. We've got guys coming from Montana. I mean, you know, it's everyone has figured out that, hey, wintertime, White River's really pun face to fish. And so, you know, I try to manage people's expectations now that, hey, this isn't exactly what it used to be. We still have some shots. Some days we may still land 10, 12, 15 fish. 
But some days the reality is, you know, you may, especially if you're committed to that six, seven, eight, nine inch fly, you may be fishing for one fish. You know, it may be a hero or zero type deal, you know, especially you get a high pressure bluebird days. But, you know, this weekend I got a guy coming in from Texas. He wants to hunt. We got rain. We've got about 12,000 CFS. Um, that should be really good conditions. We're ahead of the crowd for um, all of our guys coming down to fish for the winter. So, you know, it's not unrealistic to think that we could put, you know, five, six, seven, eight, ten really nice fish in the boat on streamers. So in summertime, even, you know, we've got a kind of a common thought process that wintertime is streamer season. But, you know, we still have some great streamer fishing in the summertime, um, maybe even better, you know, sometimes in the summer when the water's not quite so cold and their metabolisms aren't quite so low and you know they're not thinking about making sweet love and they're thinking about uh you know chomping food so yeah i want to i want to eat steak three times a day yeah that's yeah, right yeah that's, that's right, right. <laughs> <laughs> the summer bites my favorite i can't i can't help it you know i mean there is nothing just, there is nothing like being in the boat guiding not got whatever in in bare feet shorts and a t-shirt or a, a right. light, light fishing shirt, you know, you kind of have to yep. look the part. But, you know, there is nothing like being in the boat in the summertime. Even if it's a little bit too hot, it's better than, I like it better than, you know, being all bundled up in the winter, trying not to freeze your fingertips off and, and that sort of thing. When I get too hot, I can strip my clothes off and jump in the White River and cool off. Climb back in the boat, put my shorts and my shirt back on. All right, folks, we're good to go now. <laughs> in the wintertime, I don't have that option. You know, there's no way to warm up any more than you already are. So we're just out there suffering, hoping that the hand warmers will make it to the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Oh. It is a weird, weird feeling in the winter when you put a fish back in the water and your hands have been cold all day and you slide that fish back in. You think, man. This water is so much warmer than the air temperature. Yes. This this 48 degree water actually feels warm right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird feeling. Yeah, kind of liking it. Yeah, all of a sudden yeah, it's, that's right. it's pretty good. <laughs> you pull them back out and they get hit with that air yeah. temperature. <laughs> yeah. Then you are looking for, I look for the hand warmers. I probably look for the hand warmers as much as I look for anything during the winter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so before we go, Matt, I want to talk a little bit more about streamers. I don't want to make this a complete streamer episode, but I want to go back to those those articulated, those bigger streamers that we're talking about. Now, you fish some of that, right? Oh, absolutely. It's an effective way to fish in the winter. It's a fun way to fish in the winter. The grind, a lot of guys, you know, it's 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 becoming part of the culture. You know, guys want to come down here and grind out hero or zero looking for that big fish trying to catch a new personal best and so yeah it's, it's part of our wintertime culture and is fishing those big streamers for sure so y'all fishing those on floating lines sinking lines that's what, what are y'all doing mostly my weapon of choice um is an eight weight um as you know i'm a winston guy i'm on their pro staff that's all i fish is winston rods the eight weight alpha plus is my favorite rod for that. I fish 330 grain, um, sinking lines on them. So a little bit heavier than a, you know, your standard 300 grain, unless we have low water, you know, we get a low water year, you know, I might scale it back down to a seven weight and a six weight and, and do some other stuff. But for traditional 15,000 or bigger bank banging, yeah, I'm throwing an eight weight with a full sinking line. And, you know, a lot of those big, Kelly Gallup flies or Russ Madden flies. Um, Russ was kind of one of my favorite influencers when I first started uh, fishing streamers. Um, he's a guy up in Michigan. I don't know if you know Russ or not. He created the Circus Peanut, oh, the yeah. Mad Pup, um, the Kraken, I believe was his. He he had a couple of really good ones, but the Circus Peanut was, you know, that was like the only streamer I needed for a long time. Right. I had a lot of faith in that thing for sure. So, no, uh, or Andreas Anderson, I fish a lot of his patterns. He's now who is that? Andreas is a tire out of Sweden and he is the cleanest deer hair work you've ever seen in your life. I mean, it just, it will absolutely blow you away. So, um, it's always fun getting packages shipped internationally from Sweden oh, yeah. from him. Yeah. But, but I mean, I just, I can't tie bugs that clean, you know, I mean, and they're, they're remarkable. They, they swim well, they fish well. And I like to support local tires, uh, you know, or, or not, I shouldn't say local he's in Sweden, but I like to pr support tires, you know, yeah. not, um, conglomerates if I can help it, you know, I, I'd certainly rather, um, have a guy help me out. That's, Trying to make a living tying bugs versus uh, having them 
produced in a sweatshop somewhere. Do you uh, do you have a website? Does he have a website? Uh, Andreas is on Instagram, and I think he's just like at Andreas Anderson thirteen thirteen, perhaps. I'm without looking, but if you search uh, Andreas Anderson, you'll definitely find him. Um, he's made a couple trips down to the White River. He's fished here, um, so I've gotten to meet him a few times and, and connect with him. And that was how I ended up, you know, falling in love with his bugs. But they're really remarkable. They must be. You speak highly of them, and I don't. Think, I mean, I'm telling you, I don't, think I've I, heard of I don't know. I don't know of a tire in the U.S. that that has as clean a deer here. I love deer. I have a love hate relationship with deer here, and it's mostly hate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. So, so anytime that I can get somebody to do that for me, I'm all for that for sure. Sure. Before we get too far into the closing here, what what's the a good size bug to throw in an eight weight? For, for what you're talking about you know i would say like a standard um the fly that those fish probably see the most which you know i would call it a guide fly or what have you, you know is a double deceiver and kind of that six six inch range seven inch range is is really my favorite you can throw them bigger but if you throw them six inches you still get some bycatch right like you're still appealing to a 16 17 18 inch trout and you know, quite frankly, those fish are still a lot of fun. Yeah. So, right. uh, you know, I don't like to just limit my scope to, hey, uh, I'm going to only throw this nine inch fly all day long in hopes that one fish eats it. Um, because the reality is the two of the largest trout I've ever caught in Arkansas, one of them was on a style bug and one of them was on a, um, a slump buster, <laughs> you know, I mean, a, a, a streamer the size of my thumb, Right. you know, right. so I, I think there comes a point where a lot of these big, big fish almost become too lazy to chase a streamer you know i think there's there's an opportunity where they will but you know they're just as likely that that 30 inch fish is just as likely to eat a six inch fly as he is a nine inch fly especially if it's presented to him right you know save your shoulder save your gear you know i mean it puts a lot of stress on those rods throwing those big bugs like that and landing them in the trees and in the rocks and jerking them around and, <laughs> you know you break a lot of rods so yeah i don't know six six inches to me is um is perfect i think the speed of them and, and this is opinion is really all this is and i guess probably from seeing it but man speed for the bigger fish is, it's just critical it just is. I don't know why. Sure. If you've got somebody swinging a streamer, a lot of times you get you, you don't you may not get a, even a look for ten minutes. As soon as you lift that anchor off the bottom and start moving, and they throw it out there, boom, you get a hit. I don't know how many times it's happened to me. Like mm-hmm. like it's almost like it, that swinging streamer is going way too fast, but slowing it down seems to help or getting the right speed. Mm-hmm. For me, throwing those bigger bugs. On, on the swing, I don't really like that fly to turn back upstream. I'm a big proponent of fishing downstream when I'm nymphing. I'm a big proponent of fishing downstream when I'm throwing dry flies. But you'll catch me throwing streamers dead even or even sometimes a little behind. Because if you throw it a little behind, that fly might have a little bit longer to hang on that ledge, on that cut bank. And is a, is a you know, a four, five, six inch fingerling really going to turn up river and attempt to swim up river uh in 15 20 thousand cfs so for me that i think that's why that swing sometimes isn't especially on our big tailwaters you know it's not like uh out west where you've got much smaller water those fish have to make a big commitment to come up and and, and in that much current they really be sure they're going to eat it and it's something they want to eat to make that commitment to move through a a eight nine ten foot water column and we've got one particular tailwater can be 15 foot deep maybe 20 in a lot of places 20 feet the other one six to eight foot deep with a few places 15 foot one Mm -hmm. one or two maybe corners that are deeper than that so you're right i think that the definitely different waters require different techniques in a way Mm -hmm. but the fly size is is something that folks would want to think about maybe adjusting their retrieve and adjusting like you said I would I would fish some upstream. You would fish some downstream. I think we both probably would have luck, um, right. and it may depend on the day to figure out one one is better than the other. But for your water, it's this way. For this other water over here, it may be another way. So I think trying those different things, keeping in mind size fly you're, you're trying to fish is a it's a big deal. It's a it's a mm-hmm. big big proposition to spend all day to maybe not catch anything. Or maybe catch right. one fish, or maybe catch twenty. You know, that's right. Yeah, that's right. You and, just don't know. And you may go back tomorrow and catch nothing. You know, that's the beauty of it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. The maddening that's exactly beauty right. of it. <laughs> yep. 
Wow, man, that was a quick hour. It looks like it's about an hour, honestly. Um, cool. I think we hit on a lot of good things here, Matt. We went from, we started in Memphis, went out to Colorado, came back to Arkansas, went kind of went back out to Colorado, came back That's to the right. White River. That's right. That's right. <laughs> You started fishing. You, I think it's a cool story that you went over to the to your dad's cabin, and that's how. And I mean, sound like the Lord just put this right in your lap and said, "Here you go. This is what you're that's going right. to do." That's uh, right. But it was nice to have you in here, man. The the owner of Rising River Guides in Cotter, Arkansas. You can find him at uh, risingriverguides.com. The White River System below Bull Shoals Dam. Say that ten times. Uh, Easy for you to <laughs> that's say. That's right, Matt. Man, thanks for thanks for stopping by and visiting with us. Hey, thanks for having me. It was an awesome time talking with you, David. Hopefully, one day maybe we'll wet a line together. Uh, I do believe we will. I believe uh, I'm I'm got it in the back of my mind right now that I need to get back over there. Maybe it's more of a want. I don't know, but. I'm kind of feeling like that probably. It's probably, an, it's probably. I think need. so. Yeah. 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 It's probably all the need. rods plus one. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> thanks to all the listeners out there, man. I, we, we I really appreciate you coming by. I appreciate all the support. We've, my, we've had really good support from the, from the folks that listen to us, uh, have some really good comments. We, we've got a, a Facebook page, uh, that you just search a podcast by southeastern fly and if, if you want to get in on that just go ahead and hit that subscribe button and i'll i'll get you in there because we've got some stuff that there's a little bit of information that goes on in there every week that don't necessarily we don't necessarily let it out everywhere if you can hit that subscribe button too anywhere you listen to po- you listen to podcasts that'd be great but uh thanks for joining us on southeastern fly <laughs>